Hello and welcome. Sorry about the delay. My name is Dr. Ola Brown. I'd like to welcome everybody um, to the launch of our Healthcare Financing and Impact Investing Report. I'm super, super excited to be here and to see so many registrations. Um, we had 400 people register to join um, from about 15 different countries, um, especially welcome to the people joining from outside Africa that have obviously an interest in African healthcare. I'm very excited to be giving my opening remarks um, to welcome everybody and set some context and then go into a panel session um, in collaboration with STEERS, um, STEERS Data, the company that helped us um, put together the reports. Um, I'm excited. Um, I think this will be an interesting discussion where we'll be discussing the problems of healthcare in Africa as well as the solutions. Um, and I look forward to interacting with everybody on the chat. So if you do have a question at any point, um, if you could just put your name on the chat um, with your questions so that when we're going through the panel session, um, we can answer all your questions and we're aiming for this to be as interactive as possible. Hello and welcome again. And I look forward um, to a really interesting dialogue. So the title of my presentation is Africa's Wicked Healthcare Problems and How to Solve Them. So what is a wicked problem? The term wicked problem actually was introduced by two design theorists, Rittle and Weber. And their whole idea was unlike the tame problems of mathematics and chess, Wicked problems lack clarity, both in their aims and in their solutions. In addition to the challenges of articulation and internal logic, they're subject to real world constraints that prevent multiple and risk-free attempts at solving them. And throughout the course of this presentation, we'll be looking at those real world constraints um, in a lot of detail, I'm trying to think around the solutions to them. So as we know, Africa has the worst healthcare in the entire world. When you look at the number of mothers um, that die in the process of pregnancy and childbirth, that's uh, maternal mortality. Um, you see that in certain parts of even Nigeria, the number of women that die in childbirth and pregnancy can be as high as one in nine, um, compared to in America, where it's one in 5,000. When you look at the number of children that die under the age of five years old, Nigeria actually has one of the highest child mortality rates in the entire world, higher than places like Iraq and Afghanistan. When you look at the number of uh, the infectious disease burden, or when you look at the number of people that die in traumatic accidents, you can see again um, that in terms of healthcare indicators, Africa lags behind the rest of the world. The question is why? I have three answers as to why. Poverty, poverty, and poverty. Yes. There are other problems of corruption and medical tourism and brain drain and lack of innovation and macroeconomic policy and low insurance coverage and political will. But really at the center, the foundation that's driving all these things is poverty. And we're gonna dig a bit deeper into that and try and understand the dimensions of this poverty problem that we have in Africa. Because poverty tends to increase the need for healthcare while simultaneously reducing the ability of African countries to pay for it. So people that live in poverty generally don't have money to have nutritious diets, for instance, so there's high rates of uh, malnutrition. Access to clean water is a problem, so you see high rates of diarrheal illnesses. Even sort of access to education affects the healthcare outcomes because people's health-seeking behaviors um, are skewed. 
So poverty increases the need for healthcare because of access to information, because of access to diagnostics, etc. But it also reduces the ability of African countries to pay for it because African countries are so much poorer. But even in Utopia, the countries that we consider utopian, the Nordic countries like Norway and Finland, for instance, a few years ago, Finland's government actually resigned over failed healthcare reform. Healthcare is actually a challenge for most countries around the world. So say in the NHS, there's always during elections um, a lot of debate around the lack of NHS funding. When you go to America, I mean, the biggest sort of election issues and some of the most polarizing um, topics that split people aggressively between political viewpoints are around healthcare. Obamacare versus Trumpcare versus Medicare. Uh, where, do we have Medicare for all? And also the debates around the number of people that don't have access to healthcare. Um, and I've just put in a picture from um, an Australian newspaper where the healthcare system is called overloaded and dysfunctional, um, as doctors reveal a crisis in emergency departments. So healthcare is definitely an issue for even rich countries. Um, one of my favorite professors, um, he, he special, he's an economist, but he specializes in, in healthcare research. His name is Professor John Goober from MIT. Um, and he points out that in 1950, the American government spent 5% of GDP on healthcare. In 2012, it spent almost 20% of GDP on healthcare. And by 2075, it's predicted to be 40%. And that means that 40 cents out of every single dollar generated in America will be going to healthcare. So back to the issue of poverty, this is like a, a lovely picture, one of my favorite pictures of, of Norway. I, I just think it's such a beautiful, um, of Finland, sorry, I just think it's such a beautiful country, especially in the winter. Um, and we're just going to do a deep dive and, and, and look into the problem of poverty. So if you put all the money generated in America into a bag and distributed it to each citizen, each citizen would actually get $65,000, and, and that's not, not a bad living. Um, if you did the same thing in Australia, you, you would get about $55,000. If you did the same thing in Finland, despite the cold, you'd get $49,000. And in the UK, you would get $43,000 because of what the economy produces. In Nigeria, if you did the same exercise today, you'd get $2,000 or less. And if you did the same in Malawi, you would get $400. So African countries, on simply an economic basis, on the amount produced per person, um, are exponentially poorer, and they have a higher burden of healthcare needs. I think the central slide um, for this presentation is this one. For healthcare to be supplied, somebody has to pay for it. And this could be the government via tax income and levies. It could be people paying out of pocket, or it could be insurance companies. But definitely, if your pockets are tidy, like this lady's pockets, and they're full of dollars, um, it's probably easier for you to pay out of pockets um, than a lot of people in Africa that don't have pockets. And definitely, even if they have pockets, their pockets have narrow cities or around. And I'll talk about the currency issues a bit later. But I think if we're going to take anything away from this presentation, it's a central point that somebody has to pay for healthcare. Either the government, they pay out of pocket, or through insurance. Um, and I'll go on to why in the next slide. So we're, in the next slide, we'll talk about um, government, the um, government's payments. So if you look at 
taxes in OECD countries, then out of the GDP of the entire country, an OECD country, um, so a European country, a developed nation, um, would take about 35% of GDP in taxes. When you have 35% of GDP in taxes, you probably have enough money um, to be able to pay for whatever healthcare you want to. However, when you come and when you come to what we call the Europe of Africa, South Africa, um, they actually managed to get about 29% of GDP in taxes. So that's, that's a good tax rate. Um, when you come to Kenya, they collect about 18% of GDP in taxes, and Ghana does about the same. In Egypt, it's less than half of an OECD country that they're able to collect in tax, so about 15%. In Afghanistan, there's been a war. They're still able to collect 9% of GDP in taxes. But in Nigeria, and many other countries in sub-Saharan Africa, we collect about 6% of GDP in taxes. So if you wanted to use tax money to fund your healthcare system, then you'd find out that in an OECD country that collects this huge amount, remember their economies are much larger anyway, so 35% of a large amount, it's so much easier to fund, to, um, fund the healthcare system than 6% of a very tiny amount. And remember that no country in the entire world has achieved universal health care without massive state support. But obviously, looking at this graph alone, you can see state support has a very fluid definition. The budget of the UK NHS is about $250 billion, approximately. Um, and that takes care of a population of about 60 million people. On the federal side, so I'm not talking about states, the federal healthcare budget is about a billion dollars. So that means that if Nigeria was to get the NHS budget just given to us, $250 billion, it would be enough to pay our healthcare budget for 250 years. That's like three lifetimes. If they gave that money to me to manage, and um, I put it in some stock, stock and some shares across the world, then it would probably last us for 400 years. Bearing in mind, okay, inflation and the IRR, I think I could make it last for 400 years. Um, so this is the stark and exponential difference that we're talking about here. And I want to dig a bit deeper into this $1 billion in Niger um, Nigerian figure, because this is what, there's a big difference between what happens with developed world budgets and what happens with budgets in sub-Saharan African countries. But $1 billion um, in Nigeria, with Nigeria's federal budget, and $1 billion according to the King's Fund, um, is enough to cover the budget of one of the, NH one of the NHS hospitals for a year. So um, if we gave our healthcare budgets um, to the UK, um, it would run one hospital for a year. One billion dollars lasts three days in the NHS. Um, so it would run the NHS across England for three days. Not Scotland, not Wales, just England. Um, our entire budget would last them three days. Um, and talking about the difference between, like I mentioned, budgets in the um, developed world and budgets in sub-Saharan Africa, um, this is the Chancellor of the Exchequer in the UK. And when they announce their budget, it's, it's a bit theatrical, right? There's this big red suitcase um, and, you know, the budget is announced. But I want you to take a closer look at his eyes. What do you see? I'll tell you what I see. I see confidence. He might look lean in this picture, but fiscally, he's a sumo wrestler or bigger. This budget is actually a complete budget. It's not guesswork. They have the exact amount of money that they budgeted. But when you look at budgets in sub-Saharan Africa, um, this is a better representation. 
it's more or less fiction. It's an idea of what could be achieved. Um, we make our budgets, but the problem of poverty is it lowers your options. We put together a budget, numbers that we would like to have, but then, you know, what actually becomes reality um, depends on so many other factors. What we can borrow from China, what we can get from donors, depends on the price of a very volatile commodity. But definitely there's a big difference between this level of confidence, where when they announce their budget, the budget is actually the budget. And um, a lot of sub-Saharan African countries announce a budget, but sometimes it can be 50%, 60% shortfall in the actual budgeted amount. So just because we say that we have a budget of $1 billion doesn't mean that there's $1 billion in cash for the healthcare system. It means that that is what we hope for. But um, really, it depends on so many factors that it's almost fictional, especially in the smaller African countries. Um, and in Nigeria, 66% um, of the budget is actually spent um, on debt servicing. So almost 70% is gone on paying back debt. And you can imagine um, if you work for a company and you have a salary and every year, 70% of your salary goes on paying back people that you owe, then that means you only have 30% to do everything that you want to do. And for a country, it means that we basically are working with 30% to pay salaries, to invest in defense, to invest in security, to pay police, to pay for street lights, to pay for infrastructure, and to pay for healthcare. So government spending, um, like I said, there are three payers for healthcare. There's government spending, there's out of pocket, and there's insurance. I've spoken about the problems of the government model, um, but now um, let's talk about out of pocket spending because this is it, it's quite interesting. A lot of people ask me, why don't you just make it cheap enough for people to pay out of pocket? Nigerians have cash. So why not just reduce the price of healthcare to the point that people can just pay for it? Um, this is an analysis of the number of people living on more than $10 a day in different countries. So this is China. And in China, 500 or 600 million people, 600 million people live on um, more than $10 a day. This is South Africa, out of 35 million people, only 15 million live on more than $10 million a day. So there's a huge difference between Asia, where you have a higher proportion of people as a percentage of the population living on more than $10 a day, um, compared to sub-Saharan Africa here, where very few people live on more than $10 a day. So this is actually, you know, we, we have a lot of debates about Nigeria versus Ghana, but I think that these are the most sort of startling Nigeria versus Ghana figures that I've ever seen. So this is Ghana. Um, and Ghana has 5 million people out of a total population of about 30 million people um, that live on more than $10 a day. And there, here is Nigeria. We have 4 million people living on more than $10 a day out of 200 million. Which means that even in absolute numbers, Ghana has more people with the capacity to pay for healthcare, the capacity to pay taxes, capacity to pay for well, more or less anything um, than, than Nigeria has. And if you look at the rest of the African countries, Zambia, Mozambique, Angola, Tanzania, Uganda, Kenya, Niger, Malawi, you see that proportion really, really begin to shrink. Um, and this has two sort of consequences, if you like. Number one is that tax revenues are very low because it's very difficult to tax people that can't afford food. Um, and secondly, it makes it near impossible for people to be uh, able to pay out of pocket. 
There's some places in Nigeria that people spend up to 80, 90% of their income on food. In the UK, they spend seven, maybe 12% of their income on food at the very most. So in developed countries, there's a huge amount of disposable income to be spent on things aside from food. But in sub-Saharan Africa, most of people's income is going on sustenance. So that's the out of pocket model, more or less gone, at least um, for African countries. But is it really possible to base any healthcare system around out of pocket payments? The cost of the, an NHS ICU bed is about £2,000 per night. That means per month, it's about £100,000 for a one month stay in intensive care. Now, the average income in the UK is about £30,000. So that means even most of the UK's population would go completely bankrupt within a month. And remember, there are people that spend three months or four months in ICU. But the majority of even the population of a rich country will go bankrupt within a month. And this is a country, of course, where almost everybody lives above $10 a day. So we've spoken about government spending. We've spoken about out of pocket and its problem. And remember, the main points that I made at that beginning, that slide in the beginning, is for healthcare to be supplied, somebody has to pay. And there are three main payers. The government, out-of-pocket payments, the patients, or insurance companies. So let's have a brief look at insurance. Now, there's no doubt that risk pooling decreases the out-of-pocket costs for healthcare. This fact is supported, uh, is supported by practically irrefutable evidence. But even in a rich, high-income, capitalist-leaning um, country like America, probably the most capitalist-leaning country in the world, the state still covers the healthcare expenses for one in three citizens. So through Medicare, Medicaid, which is government, and the military, of course, which is also um, government, they cover the expenses of nearly one in three people. And the large proportion of people that have insurance are employer-sponsored insurance, which means that they're people that work in a job with a company in the formal sector. Now, in sub-Saharan Africa, majority of people do not work in a job with a company. They're farmers or market women or petty traders or simply unemployed. But they're definitely not working within a corporation and therefore wouldn't be able to get employer-sponsored insurance. And one of the biggest sort of criticisms of the American system is that when a person loses their job, they also lose their insurance. And this has become a big subject of a really aggressive debate, even in America, about the fact that healthcare is often tied to employment. And once a person loses their employment, they lose access to healthcare. But this would be difficult to replicate um, in sub-Saharan Africa, simply because most people are not employed, um, at least formally. Um, so having an employer-led type of insurance um, wouldn't quite work. So let's look if it could work in the informal sector, perhaps, if we could start an informal sector model to, to insure people. And I'll talk about my healthcare insurance in, in Nigeria. So that my healthcare insurance is about 500,000 naira per year. So about $1,300. Um, I still end up paying out of pocket for everything. It doesn't cover any of my healthcare needs. Um, so whenever I go into a hospital, they say, oh, you know, your insurance doesn't cover it because I bought the cheap one um, and that I'd have to um, 
pay out of pocket. So I end up paying out of pocket. It's, it's false economy, really. I should have just bought something more expensive. But, um, you know, I, I always end up paying out of pocket for most of my healthcare needs because it really doesn't cover anything. And, um, you know, um, so most of the times I go to the hospital, I pay in cash. Um, but it's $1,300. Now, when you look at the earning of the Nigerian population, half of the Nigerian population don't earn in total up to $1,300 per year. But even if they did, and they used their entire income to pay for insurance, it still wouldn't cover their healthcare needs. They'd still need to pay out of pocket. It wouldn't cover all of their healthcare needs. So, We need to think more carefully about insurance and what it would cover and the numbers that would need to be covered by insurance to get a basic package of care. I'm just going to address two more um, issues before I close. Um, people tend to ask me when I talk about healthcare in Nigeria, and I've been speaking about it for years, you know, what about India? India is just as poor as Nigeria, yet they've managed um, to, have, to create a great healthcare system. In fact, Nigerians, rich Nigerians, fly to India for treatment. Aren't they poor like us? Well, actually, they're not poor like us. They're poor in a different way from us. So India actually has a much larger middle class than most African countries. I'll take Nigeria as an example. There are about 12,000 roughly, uh, 12,000 roughly dollar millionaires in Nigeria. That's compared to nearly a million dollar millionaires in India. And when you look at the middle class, there are about 2 million households earning $9,000 per year in, India, um, in Nigeria. That compares to over 100 million households in India earning over $9,000. The only indicator where Nigeria surpasses India is actually poverty. So we are better there. Nigeria has 90 million people living in extreme poverty compared to India that just has 70 million people living in poverty. So 5% of the Indian population live in extreme poverty, whereas in Nigeria it's closer to 60% of the population living in extreme poverty. So they have more rich people and we have more poor people. So even with poverty, there are different levels. So when we talk about India, when we talk about copying the Indian model, we need to bear in mind that they have a much larger middle class. And with a larger middle class, you can actually cross subsidize. So you can pay for the poor, healthcare for the poor with money from the rich. But you can only do that when you have a significant number of rich. Um, and in Nigeria, that's um, not, to the same proportion, or that doesn't happen, um, hasn't occurred to the same proportion as India. Finally, I think this is my favorite slide. Um, one of the things that people often tell me is, you know, Ola, you should advocate for policy that stops medical tourism. If we can just stop medical tourism, if we can just stop politicians flying out, then healthcare in Nigeria will be perfect. We just need to stop people traveling because they're so greedy that they don't improve the healthcare system here and they go and travel to India and we're stuck here. If you can just stop medical tourism for all politicians, healthcare in Nigeria will be good. Um, I can remember a few years ago, I was, I was in Los Angeles and I don't normally tell people that I'm a doctor because then they start talking about medical things with me and I was on holiday. Um, but I, I, was, I was in an Uber and it kind of slipped out. Um, so um, the Uber driver actually started telling me how he almost got killed in Mexico um, when he went for his knee operation. And I was like, wait, Mr. Uber, Stanford University has just spent a billion dollars on their new medical center. This is one of the most advanced facilities in the world here in California. There are some of the best medical facilities in the entire world in the states. And the states on its own, on a standalone basis, California State, if it was a country, would still be one of the richest countries in the world. 
You have money, you have the resources, you have the infrastructure, you have the clinicians, you have one of the best medical schools in the world, you have the expertise. Why on earth would you go to Mexico to go and do your operation? Why would you travel out of the country and go to all that stress? And he told me that he couldn't afford it. And when we looked at the cost of insurance and we looked at the cost of um, out-of-pocket payments, I, I actually realized it was true. He, he, he actually couldn't afford it. Um, and the story kind of highlighted to me that a country can have the most advanced medical facilities in the entire world or they will not benefit the poor unless there's some way that the poor can have access to them. So even if we stop medical tourism, what we'll have is a lot of high level hospitals that really a very small percentage of the population can afford. But what we're solving for when we talk about investing in the healthcare system in Africa is not fixing it for the 0.5% of the population, but trying to find solutions that can benefit everybody. So um, I, spent, I spent a lot of time talking about the problems. Um, and that's because I think that healthcare is a very emotive subject. Um, and sometimes we miss some of the nuances around it and, and the logic and the numbers. Um, so I just wanted to give us a refresher because I think it's better to solve the right problem approximately than to solve the wrong problem exactly. Um, this is one of my favorite Albert Einstein quotes. He says, if I had an hour to solve a problem, I'd spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem and five minutes thinking about the solution. And then this is the godfather of, of management strategy, Peter Drucker. He says that the manager who comes up with the right solution to the wrong problem is more dangerous than the manager who comes up with the right solution to the wrong problem. So hopefully we've established now the problem and then we can start talking about the solution. So what have we learned so far? We've learned that most countries around the world struggle to provide healthcare to citizens, despite the fact that they're exponentially wealthier. We've also learned that healthcare has a price and somebody needs to pay that price. And there are three main payers, government, insurance, or out of pocket. And we've learned some of the issues with all of those, um, all of those methods of payment. And, and we've also learned that Africa's healthcare is so poor because neither of these peers pays the price effectively. And no country achieves universal healthcare with massive, without massive government spending. Even the ones that on the outside look like they're insurance-based or private-based. So, now that we understand the problems, I feel like I'm in a good position to make a case for why we should be thinking about investing in healthcare. Because I believe that within every problem, there's a solution and there's an opportunity, but only if you are solving the right problem. The first, case, uh, the first sort of um, parameter on which I'll make the case is um, the argument for jobs. Most um, sub-Saharan Africa also has some of the highest unemployment rates in the entire world. And it's estimated that investment in healthcare will create 16 million jobs. The UK NHS is not just a health producing machine. It's also a job producing machine. It's the sixth biggest employer in the entire world. If you look at every single American state, the biggest employers, I think apart from that state where Walmart is, the biggest employers are always in healthcare and education. African young people need jobs and healthcare produces jobs. And it's also linked to security. Now, I believe that some people um, are involved in crime in Nigeria, maybe because they have criminal tendencies, 
But most people that are involved in crime in Nigeria have, are, are involved in crime because they have nothing else to do. They don't have work. And it's desperation. A lot of the insecurity in Africa is fueled by desperation to make a living. And if we can just solve this jobs problem, then we actually get to the second point. We solve an economic problem. And we solve an economic growth problem. Healthcare is also counter-cyclical. So a lot of portfolios um, in um, sub-Saharan Africa, including Nigeria, dependent on commodities, which are very volatile. But healthcare, the price of healthcare doesn't change that much. It's not so, as subject to boom and bust um, as commodities. So one of Nigeria's biggest problems is, is the oil price. Um, that's you know the only thing that we do. The, most of our forex comes from oil. And oil can be $100 um, at one point and be close to $10 at another point. So there's a boom and bust, which produces a lot of volatility in a lot of African countries. And the same with a lot of the commodities that um, we um, produce. And healthcare is counter-cyclical. It it's not as subject to boom and bust as, as commodities. And it evens out our portfolio. So if we invest in healthcare, it's a good counter-cyclical investment. It also tracks against inflation, so it's, it's defensive. Um, and I don't want to, I don't, while I'm talking about the economic indicators and the indicators for investment portfolios, I, I also want to talk about the fact that it's transformative and life-saving. Um, and the estimated market opportunity for healthcare and wellness is uh, $265 billion. Um, so it's a huge market opportunity, um, which holds the potential for economic growth, which is great for portfolios, particularly in Africa, which is transformative um, and, and, and creates lots of jobs in the process. So it's really the, the perfect type of investment um, for, for Africa, as long as you understand the problem. Um, so I'm going to finish on, you know, one of my favorite final thoughts I'd, I'd like to share before we go into the panel session. And, and, and this is a thought. Um, that as long as you understand the problem, capital deployed in the right way can be used as a tool to generate transformational impacts as well as returns. Thank you. Um, so now I'll be handing over um, to Mr. Michael from Steers Data. Um, who will begin the panel session. During the panel session, um, we'll be speaking about the reports and um, some of the solutions that the report saw, and some of the solutions and really case studies um, that the report highlights, and also our personal um, experiences as operators um, and investors and researchers in the healthcare field. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed um, the talk. Thank you very much, Dr. Ola. Good morning to everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here. As Dr. Ola mentioned, my name is Michael Farmaruti. I am co-founder and chief economist at STAIRS, and I will be moderating this panel. Um, so before I kick on, I will give the other panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves. Um, I do want to say that that was a brilliant presentation, Dr. Ola. Um, I consider myself a bit of a healthcare expert, and yet I always learn from conversations with you. So always a pleasure. Um, so just a brief introduction about STAIRS and the background for the report. Um, STAIRS is an information company. Our goal is to help plug the data and information gap in Africa and for Africans. At STAIRS Data, we focus on providing bespoke research and analysis for companies that are looking to make strategic and investment decisions, particularly around the areas of digital economy, technology and innovation. A fine example of that is the, this impact investment in healthcare report, um, where we partner with flight doctors. Um, and the goal of the report essentially is to, one, create a case for the role that impact investment can play in plugging this financing gap, but also to provide some sort of guide for stakeholders that are interested in making those investments. So um, as we kick off the panel session, um, I would please ask the attendees to put down any questions you have in the chat. And when we get to the Q&A, um, I will go through the questions in the first come, 
for surfaces. So quick as fingers wins. Um, so Andrew, perhaps you can give us a brief intro about yourself. Of course, of course. Um, thanks, Michael, and th thanks, Dr. Ola, for for coordinating this this session. Um, so my name is Andrew. I'm the co-founder of a company called Life Stores Healthcare, which is aiming to democratize access to quality and affordable primary healthcare in in Africa. Um, it, really, our our approach leverages the insight that um, in the primary healthcare space pharmacies and chemists are the most visited point. Um, so we're really working with them and, and other providers to try and optimize um, what the, the experience and the services they're able to provide to the patient. Um, our, our key service to date is called OGA Pharmacy. And effectively, it's, it's a digital pharma marketplace that brings together, on the one hand, the drug manufacturer manufacturers and importers, um, and then on the other hand, healthcare providers. Um, the, the idea behind it is that any given individual pharmacy or, or clinic um, oftentimes doesn't have the purchasing volume to negotiate effectively with the manufacturer for a great price. So they're faced in some way with the devil's bargain of either purchasing at a fairly high price from a wholesaler or the manufacturer or taking their chances going to one of the big open markets like Ijumota market for, for medications, um, where sometimes the prices are cheaper, but you're flipping a coin on whether it's, it's a fake drug or genuine. And in many cases, it, it is fake. Um, so, so we're trying to provide them an alternative where we're leveraging, aggregating all of their procurement volume together, negotiating great prices with manufacturers and importers, um, and then passing a lot of those savings on to the pharmacies. Um, apart from that, um, and not to take up too much time, but we, we also offer software loans and, uh, and other digital um, healthcare services to pharmacies, clinics, and, and hospitals. Thanks again for having me. Hi, hi, Abiyu. Do you want to introduce yourself? I think you're I on think mute. The audio might be off, uh, Abiyu. Yes. You're still on mute. We can just see your mouth moving. The icon should be greenish if you're off mute. And it looks like a speaker. Yes. Okay, no, we can't hear, we can't hear you. Okay. Okay, all right. So um, perhaps have a look at your audio settings. Yes, um, so have a look at your audio settings and let me know if you need to reach out, so, uh, already. <laughs> yes, exactly. Okay, all right. Um, while we wait for Abiyo to come back to us, actually, um, again, brilliant presentation, Dr. Ola. Um, I actually just then wanted to look at things from the other side, right? Um, if I'm a policymaker, I'm quite convinced and compelled that healthcare investment is a necessity right now, right? Uh, However, at the same time, we are here to talk about, you know, the role that impact investment can play. Um, and a lot of that is going to be driven by the private sector. Um, are you back with us, Abiwa? Can you speak? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Okay. Wanda. All right. Awesome. <laughs> Perfect. Um, sorry about that. So, um, I know you just got in, so I'll just do a very quick introduction. So my name is Abiyua Basaki. I am a consultant at Steers Data, actually working with Michael and um, on the team that helped to produce this report. So very much looking forward to this discussion. Okay, awesome. All right, um, thank you, panelists. So just going back to my question for Dr. Ola, 
Um, the very first question essentially is, as a private sector stakeholder, what is the case for me in of the effects that it can have for I mean, in general, what are some of the benefits for private sector stakeholders? Sorry, you cut out a bit with that question. Do you mind repeating it? Yes, yeah, so essentially the question is um, for a private sector stakeholder, um, like private investors, what are the benefits that they get from investing in Nigerian healthcare or African healthcare? Okay, so um, my name is Dr. Ola and um, I am an entrepreneur in the healthcare space. I also invest um, in the healthcare space. I'm a medical physician, um, but um, I also um, have training at this level in the um, finance and economics. So, um, I think my mom kind of thinks that I became a doctor of medicine for the doctor of one. <laughs> She's on the call. Um, so that's just, just a bit of a background to put it in perspective. So I usually speak about healthcare from um, a medical clinical standpoint, um, as well as from an economic and um, financial standpoint. And we're, we're actually invested in life goals, um, is, and Andrew is on the call as um, sort of one of our uh, portfolio companies. So it's a really nice interaction. Um, so what's the advantage um, of investing in healthcare? Um, I probably would speak with my investor from investing in um, technology companies like Helium Health, like Life Stores, like MDAS, like Kuniku, um, as well as um, investing in um, PPPs um, with um, sorts of state governments. Um, I would say for us, um, the attraction was number one, um, an attractive opportunity for some of the reasons that I mentioned in, um, in my slides. Um, so the fact that um, it's not a volatile investment, um, it's an investment that obviously we had an advantage in because um, we, we have subject matter expertise in healthcare. Um, I think that in terms of um, tracking against inflation, um, I think that it's a, a good investment um, from a portfolio point of view um, in that it's, a, it's quite a defensive sector and we have high rates of inflation um, in a lot of sub-Saharan African countries. So, um, you know, the protection from inflation or the relative protection from inflation um, was also important for us. Um, and then it's, there's a huge gap. The gap in the healthcare investment um, across sub-Saharan Africa is 66 billion. Um, so it's still quite a, a relatively um, underinvested sector. And, and when there's a gap um, that huge in, in, in the market, um, then there's room for outsized returns. Um, and we also felt that you know, this is something that's transformational, um, not just from um, a ROI perspective, but also from a livelihoods perspective. Um, I mean, when you live in a country that some areas of the country, one in nine women die in the process of pregnancy and childbirth, um, then you can make such a huge disproportionate impact um, to people's lives. Um, you're actually saving lives um, when you invest in healthcare. Um, and in addition to this sort of, um, uh, as a final point on the impact side, um, our unemployment rates in Nigeria, um, you know, we have the formal statistics, but we also have um, a high proportion of underemployed um, people. Um, and I think for any sort of economic growth um, to occur, um, and for us to have uh, better security than we, we currently do, um, we, we need to get people employed. Um, we need to get graduates um, to be able to go out and actually be able to find work. Um, and this has been a problem um, in Nigeria for the past few decades, is that we, we produce more graduates than there are jobs. Um, and I think that, you know, healthcare is a good investment from um, a returns point of view. It's a good investment from a portfolio point of view. It's a good investment from um, an inflation point of view, um, but also from an impact perspective, saving lives, creating jobs, reducing insecurity. Um, a better investment would be hard to find for me. Very well. 
Very well argued, Dr. Ola. Um, thanks. So I'm actually interested to see if um, the other panelists have um, comment in this area, because we have spoke quite a bit about the case for healthcare, healthcare investment from the economic perspective. But again, just sticking to private sector stakeholders, uh, um, Andrew or Abira, do you have further comments on why this is an area that you think should be att is attractive for private sector stakeholders? Absolutely, um, absolutely. Yeah, I think it's it's a great question, and I think especially in the period that we're in, um, where we've just gone through a pandemic, and uh, of course it's it's not yet past. We're we're still in it, but but the first and kind of second waves are mostly past. I mean, it's it's really shown a light on on how critical having the right healthcare infrastructure is in in a country, and then secondly. Um, in, in places where there are significant gaps in kind of the traditional health infrastructure, ways that technology can help to, to bridge those gaps in some ways. And I, I think some of the um, maybe, so we, we've talked a little bit about healthcare investment from the macro perspective, the economic side. I think looking a little bit at the, at the micro side, some of what COVID has highlighted for us is for instance, opportunities um, to provide remote care to patients, um, whether that be telemedicine um, is, is the most obvious example. Um, there's also opportunities for remote diagnostics. Um, following that, there are opportunities for medication delivery. Um, so there, there are all kinds of different opportunities that I think um, COVID has highlighted in particular. Then I think there are also a number of interesting opportunities that are not, let's say, immediately obvious or patient facing. Um, and for instance, our Oga Pharmacy Marketplace, which is it's, it's a B2B, a, um, a business to business opportunity. Um, but effectively, it's, it's supporting providers so that they can then be um, offering more effective care to their patients. Um, and I think there are, there are a number of opportunities like that as well, um, where it's, it's supporting healthcare providers or insurers with different types of technology um, to, to carry out their, their essential work more effectively. If you're speaking a bit, I think you're on mute. Okay, I'll give you the opportunity to reconnect to your audio again. And um, you seem to be having <laughs> persistent issues there. Okay, so just um, actually switching tact. Um, so, Andrew, I'm quite interested in the pharm pharmaceutical space um, locally in Nigeria. Um, I once, you know, came across some quite starting data, right? Uh, over 70% of the medicines that are consumed in Nigeria are produced abroad. Um, and then I think when I looked at the last World Bank household survey, um, it was quite interesting to see that Nigerians are about three times more likely to go to a pharmacy or chemist than they are to go to a clinic. Um, so that just, ex that essentially shows the importance of the pharmacy space in actually delivering healthcare services to people in the country. Right. So again, just sticking to this point about private sector investment, you know, given your role as an operator, um, what are the conditions that you would say are ideal to attract private investment, um, both at the manufacturing stage and then at the retail stage of the pharmaceutical sector? Yeah, th thanks, Michael. Um, I'll, I'll share a few thoughts on uh, some of the conditions that, that would support. Um, and I think all with the context, though, that um, right now, as all of us know, in many ways, the conditions are not optimal, um, which presents certain challenges. But it does also provide opportunities, which I, I think there, there are a number of um, health tech companies and healthcare companies pursuing today, even in the conditions we have on ground today. 
So I think there's a lot we can do today already with the conditions that we do have. Um, but, but that said, um, to your question, I, I think at the, at the manufacturing stage, um, what could op optimize that opportunity? I think you could kind of divide it into um, a couple buckets. You could look at kind of um, the infrastructure piece. You could look at the, the general kind of policy piece. And then thirdly, the, the macro picture, which, which overlaps a little bit with policy. Um, but on, on the infrastructure side, I think a, a lot of what could help the overall economy very much applies to manufacturing. So, so that's um, improved roads, um, cheaper energy, um, an expansion of you know, the, the reach of energy, since right now a lot of manufacturers basically need their own kind of uh, private power plants with, assembled with generators. Um, and then uh, kind of the, on the port side, um, I, I guess unclogging the port metaphorically, so kind of reducing the amount of dashing required and just making it easier to get your products out. Um, on, on the policy side, I think there, a, a lot of the questions there rev revolve around tariffs. Um, what, what's the approach to tariffs? Um, in, in a number of time periods, we've had a situation here where the tariffs on importing finished goods are lower than importing the raw materials to produce pharma products. Um, and that certainly is a disincentive um, for, for manufacturers when that's in place. Um, and then there are some things that the government's already doing, like providing tax holidays to new manufacturers, and, and they should continue to do that. Um, then I think lastly, on, on the macro side, um, there are again a number of questions that affect the overall economy, but that very much do affect manufacturers as well um, on the pharma side. So that's, um, that's for instance, Forex, um, that's availability of dollars, like can, can you get enough dollars to, to buy your active pharmaceutical ingredients from India or you know, other markets? Um, so I, I think those are really um, a number of the questions that, that, that would enhance uh, pharma manufacturing. Um, at, at the retail stage, um, I, I would say that the, the buckets are pretty similar. Um, on the policy side, um, there's currently a restriction where two pharmacies can't be closer than 200 meters to each other. Um, and if, if that were to be lifted, that would really introduce a more competitive environment where if you have a very busy street, is there really a need to have a 200 meter restriction? You know, if you go to London, you, you can have a super drug and then you can have another pharmacy three stores away. And they're, they're there for many years. So the market is clearly supporting that. Why don't we, why can't we offer something similar in, in Nigeria? Um, then on, on the macro side, I think um, there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of issues that um, have been encouraging pharmacists in recent years to, to emigrate from the country. And this is already starting from a pretty low number of pharmacists, um, between 15 and, and 20,000 kind of registered pharmacists in, in Nigeria um, for a population of ballpark 200 million. Um, so very few relative to the population. And, um, and we've seen a lot of people moving, especially to Canada in, in recent years, to Canada and the UK. Um, so I, I think, yeah, look, looking at some of those broad economic issues um, that, that um, in the end would influence healthcare provider salaries, that, that, that's also a key issue um, that, that one can't trace to one particular issue, um, but uh, ties up with a lot of what Dr. Ola said on, on kind of spending power, the economy, et cetera. Can I just make one point? We're invested in a manufacturing company, actually, um, a drug manufacturing company. So uh, it was it was a complex negotiation because it was a it was a take private um, from the stock exchange. Um, and one of the things that um, has been I found incredibly interesting about the business and about manufacturing in Nigeria is um, is on the financing side. It's actually access to credit. So. Um, 
this wasn't from this particular company. It was it was another friend that I was um, helping to negotiate with the bank. And he got a term sheet for a loan, which was, you know, very, very exciting for him. So he said, oh, you know, Dr. Ola, you know about finance. Um, can you help me review the term sheet? And I looked at the term sheet and it said that they were willing to offer the loan. So he was like, I'm so happy. And then I read the terms um, and they asked for 300 percent collateral of 300 percent in real estate. A cash collateral of 80 percent or treasury bills, euro bonds of 150 percent. Now, I was just looking at this term sheet that, OK, wait. 300% of the amount of the real estate he should own before he, before he releases the loan. And you're going to steal three, you're going to, sorry, you're going to seize 300% of the loan amount to secure that loan. Or he should bring 80% of the cash. But if he gives you 80% of the cash and keeps it to collateralize, well, that's 20% of the money that is actually being loaned. That's not the full loan in the first place. And if he has euro bonds or treasury bills, and he gives you 150% of the amount. It's actually cheaper for him to liquidate the euro bonds or you liquidate the treasury bills than to give you 150% of the amount. He's only, lend he's only lending 100%. So I think, you know, access to credit. Um, he got credit in a manner of speaking. But uh, <laughs> um, I think also there's this issue of, of credit rationing. Um, in, in many, not just Nigeria. I mean, this is this is an issue um, a, a, across Africa. The world runs on credit, um, and I think that you know this is another area um, to look at, both from a policy perspective, um, but also I think um, as sort of finance institutions as well. Um, I mean, when there's a high CRR, when there's high inflation, um, when um, sort of the regulatory environment makes it difficult for financial institutions to lend, that's an issue. Um, but also within um, the finance sector itself, like you know, banks are the engine room of the economy, um, and we need to look at sort of seeing how um, we can get um, easier access to businesses and easier access to financing that they don't have to bring. Like I, so he was he was talking about this guy was actually talking about a structure where he didn't have the collateral, but he knew somebody that had the collateral. So he was going to go and meet this man um, that had the collateral. The man wanted 70% of the company for him to use um, the, his own property to collateralize the loan. So, you know, you have to give away 70% of your company to get a loan. To you know, it was just it was just a very difficult conversation that we had to you know have a long conversation about. You can't just go and meet some man that owns property and say that you're going to give you. You don't even know the man. He's asking for seventy percent of your company to get a loan. Um, so I think you know that's 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 an issue as well to look at. Thank you very much for those anecdotes, Dr. Ola. Um, Abia, you are you back with us? Can you speak? No, we can't. We can't hear you. Okay. We heard it before, but somehow it hasn't. It hasn't quite. Worked. Yes. When you introduced yourself. Um, okay, she's okay. left. The room right. Again. So she's she's looking, looking like she's doing that. that. Yes. Indeed. Uh, but I think that actually. Um, those anecdotes actually lead me to where I was heading, which is the reality that um, private investment is good, but not all commercial financing is fitted for healthcare, right? And you raise this issue of certain loan terms that don't add up, right? Uh, so I guess that then leads us to, you know, why impact investing in particular is more suited than say, you know, a five-year bank loan at 30% per annum with 150% <laughs> collateral. So I, I don't know if um, either you or Andrew are happy to speak on, you know, why you think private um, impact investment, you know, is more suited for financing healthcare than some other forms of commercial financing. Sure, yeah, ha happy to offer a few thoughts on that. I mean, I, I think if, if we're looking at impact investment in particular, 
and, and we kind of take the, the two sides of that phrase. I mean, on the impact side, I think um, the report that you've developed in Dr. Ola's presentation highlight a lot of the challenges um, that are there and where funding, where kind of new enterprises are needed to, to, to plug some of these gaps. So it's absolutely ripe on the impact side. And, and what are the opportunities for outcome? I mean, it's kind of live saved, um, quality life years extended, um, jobs created. So in terms of impact, I think it's, it's very tough to find another sector where you can get another, where you can get more impact than that. I mean, it's, it's probably kind of healthcare and education towards the top of the pyramid on, on where you can get impact. Um, on, the, on the investment side, I, I think it's, it, the other, it's almost the other side of the coin where um, because of the, the scale of, of some of those challenges, I mean, th that leads to a large opportunity. Um, and so, so there's a lot of pain points, whether it be at the insurer level, um, whether it be with healthcare providers for the patient, um, throughout kind of the, uh, the space, there are different pain points um, that are ripe for addressing. What I do think it requires is quite a bit of creativity because it's oftentimes the case that you can't take um, the same model that, that maybe works in, in Germany or Scandinavia, the UK, and kind of copy and paste it here. Um, we have a different environment in terms of kind of culture, in terms of um, the budget and disposable income of, of the average person, um, in terms of the infrastructure on ground. Um, so we have to work with, with what's already on ground. Um, and, and that's where I think it takes a lot of creativity and innovation. Um, on, on our side, I think one of the, the insights that, that we had pretty early on is that if, if, you're, if you're running a business um, that's, that's B2C or business to consumer, um, there's, there's, there are a number of question marks on how to attract that consumer, what exactly is that consumer looking for. Um, sorry, let, lights out for just a moment. Um, but... Um, <laughs> Um, and especially in the healthcare environment, there's that special relationship um, between the patient and the provider. Um, and all of that takes time, that, that trust takes time to build up. And so from that, we, we developed the view that rather than going straight into the B2C space, it, it likely makes sense to work um, to support the healthcare providers um, who have already developed those relationships and that trust. So how can we enhance their work rather than kind of recreating their work or competing with them? Um, and th that, that's really part of what led us to, uh, to creating OGA Pharmacy and trying to build this marketplace, um, uh, you know, marketplace to help supply them with, with cheaper medications where they can then pass a lot of that savings onto the consumer, therefore, or even further enhancing that loyalty of the patient to their business and providing them with software to run the business where kind of today a lot of people use an Excel sheet, use a notebook um, to, to manage their business. Can we give them a free, simple ERP um, that, that will help them do the same thing, but more effectively? Um, so so that's, that's a little bit about... Um, you know, I, how I'd see the opportunity on, uh, on the impact investment side and, you know, small example from our own business. Thank you, Andrew, actually, that was a very useful example um, because one of the things that I wanted us to do was before we leave today, ensure that we leave the audience with um, a few case studies of models that we've seen work here. So I think Andrew has um, essentially cheated and used a personal story <laughs> to illustrate this. So I don't know, Dr. Ola, um, in terms of models that you've seen work, um, are there any that you think that we can lean on and draw experience from to, and use as sort of a template for financing in this area? 
Absolutely. Um, just a few thoughts on impact um, investing in general, and then I, I'll sort of go into um, the case study. So, um, in terms of um, impact investing, um, we, we often think that impact investing means that people are not going to get a return, which is not true. Um, impact investing just means that there's a double bottom line. So it means that the investor is looking for a financial return, but also um, at the same time is looking at the impact metric and trying to see, you know, what will the impact of this investment be beyond the returns. So that gives us impact. Um, that gives us a type of investment that doesn't require, you know, eighty percent cash collateral. Um, that's the type of finance that may be longer term. Um, that might be it might be lower interest rate, and there might be a moratorium on the debt. Um, it's just more patient, and we call it impact investment. But that's the sort of investment that Western countries have access to as a matter of, you know, um, normal. That that's normal life um, in any um, developed country where they do have access to low income, uh, low interest rate, longer term um, financing um, for projects that we do in Africa. Um, so while in Nigeria, we're paying up people 25% interest rates. In America, it's like 1% or 2%, right? So uh, or, 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 what, what normal financing in Western countries is what we call impact financing here, um, where, you know, it's more patient, it's longer term, and generally um, it goes to um, sectors that can grow the economy. Um, so I just wanted to make that distinction. Um, and I think that... Africa, for the longest time, um, Sub-Saharan Africa has relied on doing um, so sort of donor-funded projects where the money is just put into something, and but not into a private business, but put into a project. And when that project kind of ends and the funding dries up, or they move on to a different focus, and then the project has to end as well. Whereas when you put money into a company, you have founders that continue the project and start generating their own income, and it's a lot more sustainable. Um, so I would sort of make the argument for maybe some of the donor money actually being um, diverted into um, impact investing so that it has um, sustainable um, outcomes beyond um, sort of the end of the project. Um, whereas a lot of donor funded um, projects, you know, end when they move on to the next thing that they want to focus on. Um, so that's, you know, super important um, for for um, you know our, our donor community to do that, um, would it be possible um, for them to perhaps you know look into impact investing um, as uh, or put some funds aside um, to have the impact investing either as debt or um, um, equity or some kind of mezzanine structure? I and mean, it also makes their own organisations, and um, so it's not just advantages um, to the organisation they're funding; it's also advantages to them. Um, because then, actually, it produces an evergreen structure for them where they can get returns, potentially, um, from this financing. So it makes their own organization more sustainable as well. Um, so that's sort of the word on impact investing. Now, what case studies um, do I have? Um, in general, um, we invest in structures on one side, and um, we invest in technology. Um, on the other side, and I think you know, technology is transformative, it can be transformative um, for all three things I mentioned in the book. For a transformative way to make um, government healthcare can be a transformative way um, to reduce the out of pocket spending um, by making things cheaper and efficient um, telemedicine technology, and it can also be um, a transformative way to get sort of micro-insurance products to um, a larger number of people um, in a smaller amount of time than it would um, it would be if um, traditional sales and marketing techniques or channels um, were used um, to distribute micro-insurance. Um, so I think the underlying theme in terms of, um, you know, case studies, um, for me, um, the first sort of underlying theme is the power of technology um, to help us solve problems um, a healthcare solution um, and straight to the consumer. So, countries um, also invested in something called Helium Health um, that gave you the technology solution um, to um, 
of how we work to do that. Um, we um, did a hospital project in um, a place in Nigeria, and they only had one COVID center. Um, and I think the COVID center had hundred beds. Um, so um, we were identifying four to five hundred COVID patients. And um, of course, um, it became a problem. The center became very congested. Um, so we set up a program with Helium Health um, and their telemedicine software um, that enabled us to be able to help those patients isolate at home. Um, we gave them instructions over the telemedicine software and they were monitored by nurses. Um, and we're able to keep about 80% um, of the patients um, at, at home, managed at home, um, and, and the um, medications they needed were delivered to them um, at home, so they weren't filling up the centre. Um, but also there was a price issue as well. A night in the centre was about 80,000 naira, which is over $100 per night. Um, whereas, um, you know, when they were treated on the telemedicine um, machine, um, the telemedicine software, the cost actually dropped um, from over $100 um, to about two or three dollars. I'm quickly converting Naira to dollars in my head, uh, two or three dollars. Um, so it actually ended up saving um, the government a lot of money as well. Um, the, the dollar rate in Nigeria is kind of a moving target, so I'm, I'm using 500 Naira today. Um, who knows what it will be tomorrow? Um, but um, yeah, that, that was a good uh, case study of how, you know, technology, traditional infrastructure and government were able to work together to produce a more efficient, cost-effective solution um, for people that needed it. I can see that you've made a comeback. <laughs> I mean, let's see if your sound works. And I'm hoping this is actually, can everyone hear me? Yes? Oh, finally. Okay, great. <laughs> Hi guys. Great to have you back, Abiyewa. Um, So I just asked Andrew and Dr. Ola to share any sort of case studies um, of models of impact investment or otherwise that they've seen work on the content. Um, I don't know if that's something that you're willing to contribute to you know, as part of the work that you did for the report. Yeah, sure, of course. So um, when it does come to case studies, so one thing that I did find is that because impact investment when it comes to healthcare as well is still um, it's a I guess a growing area I'll say is that first of all what um, I did look to when doing the report was seeing models in other countries and I think Dr. Ola mentioned earlier that um, people might often compare Nigeria to India and um, there were cases of successful case studies in India um, where impact investment has helped a lot so they have similar healthcare issues and one of these, for instance, was the Acumen Fund, which invests in businesses directly that have a social impact. And um, Zigista Healthcare, specifically, um, is looking to improve the emergency medical responses through increasing the number of available ambulances. So the total amount that was invested in this fund was one point in this sorry business was 1.5 million dollars and they, they did find that they were able to grow their fleet of ambulances which did result in better in better outcomes when it came to emergency issues and that was the social part of the impact but even when it came to the commercial part of the impact um, this fund ended up having a gross returns of between 10 to 15 percent so from this kind of case study we could see that they did have the impact of helping to improve healthcare out outcomes but also making sure that there were positive returns for investments and this is the kind of thing that we would want to see in nigeria so some newer types of um some newer impact investments that we've seen for instance is the evercare health fund so they recently opened up um, a large hospital in lagos and they that fund actually invests in healthcare across Asia and Africa. And some of the things that they're trying to improve is, for instance, the number of available doctors in, Niger in Nigeria or South or in Asia. They're also trying to improve the availability of healthcare supplies and when it comes to diagnostics and things like that. Um, it is still new, but it's a step in the right direction. And if it does work how we're expecting it to work, that is one 
great example of how impact investment can help to change healthcare. All right, thank you very much. I've been waiting on <laughs> not um, questions in the chat, so I'm keen on making sure that we try. Now, everybody know end of the session report because um, that's probably the question so far. On so. We've spoken about private investment that return people okay. who's willing to take that on. Sorry, Michael, can you repeat the question? You were breaking up a bit, but I heard something about, we've spoken about private returns. Yes, yeah, sir. Okay, I guess it's, sorry? I think it's Michael's network. Um, so I think what uh, Michael was asking was around returns, because that's the reason why people invest primarily. Um, if they put money into something, then they're expecting to get some money out. Is that right, Michael? And in Nigeria, I think mo a lot of foreign investors are comfortable investing in oil and gas, for instance, because it's sold globally. And, um, you know, you get returns in dollars. So you can you can mine the oil in Nigeria um, and then it's sold on a global market. Um, so you don't have the exchange rate risk. So, Michael, are you back? Are we going to be able to hear you? You're breaking up a can bit. You hear me? Oh, yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, you're frozen a bit. You've frozen. So I'm going to go through the questions um, until you come back on because there's been some interesting questions here. Um, hmm. Okay. How can insurance be optimized in improving the healthcare environment using software as a service technology? Um, you know, Andrew, I think that question is more directed at you, uh, you than, uh, than me. How can insurance be optimized in um, improving the healthcare environment using um, software as a service? Does anybody want to take that? Sure. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, that's a really interesting question. Um, I mean, I, I think... A, a, couple, a couple thoughts on that. Um, it, you know, maybe if, if we even, we could even broaden the question a little bit on, on like what are some of the ways like in insurance could be optimized. Um, I, I think specifically when it comes to the, uh, the, the, the SaaS piece of it, I mean, it ties in with a, a, a broader way that, that insurance can be optimized, which is kind of partnering with um, health tech players out there and in chains um, where they can work together to make sure that one, the quality of the services being provided um, to the patients are, are good. Um, and then two, on the medication side, that the medications are genuine, um, that the prices are good, um, so that the patient in the end is getting a good experience um, from being a member on, on that insurance plan. And I guess how, how SAS could tie in with that, I mean, one example, if, if, if you look at kind of a pharmacy that's using our software, which is called PharmaIQ, um, or uh, for instance, using Helium's software for, for a hospital, um, that software could potentially help to manage the prices, um, make sure the, the quality of services delivered is good, measure satisfaction, 
So I think um, there certainly is a key role for software to, uh, to play in, in improving um, insurance delivery. Then I think there's um, a couple of other really interesting questions with insurance. Um, I mean, one of them is around product design. The other is around how do you scale? So with, with product design, there's a really interesting question on what, what is the optimal offering um, of insurance for the different target markets, whether it be kind of employed white collar professionals or kind of informal uh, workers in, in markets where the income might be a little bit lower, what kind of mix, what kind of coverage mix um, can you offer for a price point that people can afford? Um, so I think there's that, that product question. There's a distribution question of how can you, how can you get it out there to, to many people? Um, for instance, by partnering with, with telcos, partnering with MTN or in, in other ways um, to make it really easy for people to subscribe and learn more. Um, and then I think maybe lastly, there's this issue of trust where right now, I mean, I think that the, the, the level of trust in, in many institutions um, is, is fairly low and trust in insurance is fairly low. So is there an opportunity for the government to work together with insurers to really ha have a very public campaign, build trust in the system, encourage people to kind of move in this direction of um, preventative care ra rather than curative care, which, which a great insurance system could enable. So, so those are a, a few thoughts on things we could do. All right, thanks, Andrew. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes, you're back. All right, awesome. Sorry for that interruption, and thank you for um, standing in for me during that period, Dr. Ola. Um, one thing that I picked up on from a couple of the responses um, and earlier comments is the growth of telehealth in Africa, um, particularly in response to COVID. Um, one of the questions that we got on the chat box actually was, um, for operators who are looking into this as a service, what are some of the factors that they might want to consider in terms of pricing, commercials, delivery of the service, and so on? So uh, perhaps that's something you guys can speak on. Um, so I think the primary thing to consider when we're looking at telehealth is you know, the market size. Um, there are 200 million people in Nigeria um, but only a very small proportion of them have smartphones. So um, if you're looking at an app-based product, then you have to look at the real market size. How many of them actually have smartphones? And then out of the people that have smartphones, data is another issue. Um, a lot of the people that work um, around our house have smartphones actually, because they live in Lagos. But they don't credit this, they don't, they, they don't put data on their smartphones. So sometimes I can send the WhatsApp, you say, to our driver or our housekeeper, and just them, uh, you know, I didn't buy data. Like I have the smartphone, but, you know, I switched my data off because data is extremely expensive in Nigeria compared to India. So I think the data cost is almost five times um, the cost um, of data in India. So the reason why some of these products fail to scale. Um, is because they're usually app-based um, products that rely on, number one, smartphone ownership, and number two, the capacity to buy data on that smartphone, which are two separate things. Um, and then there's a lot of plans online that have Facebook only or WhatsApp only. So even if they have data, they might not be able to access your app because they've bought a WhatsApp only plan. Um, so I think it's important to look at the feasibility of these um, sorts of business plans really carefully to make sure that when you're looking at telehealth, um, it's not sort of an imaginary figure that you actually have the addressable uh, market size that would be able to um, download your app and have the credits to use your app for video streaming, I assume, um, which is super expensive. Um, on, 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 on that app and to be able to access healthcare. And when you look at the cost of data, cost of smartphone and cost of streaming, it might actually be cheaper for them to just walk to their local health, uh, primary healthcare center and get treatment for free. Um, so sometimes ideas that we think are um, disruptive may not be that disruptive just because of the situation in a lot of African countries. And when we're doing some research around vaccination, 
um, in some of the African countries that had low vaccine uptake, one of the biggest issues was just transportation to the vaccine center. It was just too expensive. Like people didn't want to go. People didn't want to take because even though the vaccine is free, the money that you're going to use to get to the center is expensive. Um, so people just didn't want to pay the transportation costs. Um, so I think it's really, really important to do a proper feasibility study um, and um, make sure that, you know, if you're doing an app-based product, a tele, an app-based telehealth product, that you get the numbers right in terms of the number of people that have the capacity to pay. And if it's a phone-based product, so if it's based on phone calls, again, data for phone calls still comes, um, or money for phone calls still comes into play. So there's a whole number of people in Nigeria that they don't call. They just let it ring. And then you have to call them back. They don't actually use the phone to call. They flash. There's even a product by one of the major phone companies that allows you to indicate that you've made a call to get somebody to call you back. That's actually a product in Nigeria. So um, a lot of people don't use their phones to call. They use it to make contact, but not necessarily um, to call. So um, the, the products that have been very, very successful for large markets in Nigeria are actually more USSD-based products or text-based products. But um, it's 100 percent, you know, a cost issue in terms of scale, um, a coverage issue um, in terms of like rural areas, the places that need it most um, sometimes don't have, <coughs> sorry, good enough network coverage. Um, so that was what I would say about um, technology. The richest man in Nigeria sells salt and pasta and sugar. That should tell you about how advanced, you know, Af the richest man in Africa, sorry, sells salt and sugar and pasta. And I think that that gives you an indication of sort of, um, you know, how um, basics um, some of the needs are. And if you're looking at sort of an app-based app pricing solution, then you need to be looking at sort of a smaller market that's willing to perhaps pay more. Thank you. Um, you... end on this couple of questions about technology on technology question that is, um what do the tech innovation health can play in terms of being to rural parts of either nigeria or africa cool <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, Michael or Avi, I do want to answer that. What role can tech play um, when it comes to providing healthcare in rural parts of Nigeria or Africa? Um, I think, you know, from my perspective, um, if you wanted to use technology, then it would probably, um, it's not just, technology is not just telemedicine, first of all. Um, there's digital products that can be used to enhance healthcare. There's digital products that can be used. So it's not just smartphone based, right? Um, and I think we can we can um, get some of the other panelists to speak to the role of technology in providing healthcare for rural populations overall, as not just um, app based telemedicine apps. Yeah, sure. Sorry, just confirm. Can everybody hear me right now? <laughs> okay. Okay. Good. Um, so I think. The, some of the ways that we have seen tech play out in healthcare in Africa is actually when it comes to increasing the productivity of um, whether it's medical facilities, um, you know, the ability of healthcare workers to do their jobs. So um, something that we've seen actually that could help to perhaps bridge the financing gap is when it comes to even things such as like electronic medical records. Um, so we have startups such as Helium Health, for instance, that are helping um, healthcare facilities to be able to help increase their productivity by moving facilities from paper-based records to more digital health services, which helps healthcare workers save quite a lot of time and effort that is spent on that. And that time and effort that's spent on that can be gone, can be put into actually providing care for patients and, um, you know, to expand their coverage even if needed. Um, currently less than 10% of Nigerian hospitals, for instance, actually do use any kind of digital records, which means that there is a huge gap. There is a huge, um, there's a lot of room to be able to scale to ensure that they're able to use these. Um, 
Also, even when we look at providing diagnostics as well with health services, when it comes to ability to pay. So Dr. Ola actually mentioned um, uh, how USSD is something that is increasing in prevalence, especially when it comes to rural populations. Again, startups like Helium Health give um, healthcare facilities and hospitals the ability to receive payment in terms of USSD. So I think technology and digital health especially right now, can really play a huge role in helping to digitize a lot of our manual health processes and ensure that there's a lot of capacity to serve patients even more than they are currently at. I, I, I might just um, add to that and um, kind of uh, agree with everything that's been said so far. And when, when we're looking at rural populations, I think you can take the same bucket of healthcare activities that we were looking at before for the country in general, kind of including drug distribution, healthcare providers, diagnostics, insurers, all those same buckets apply to, to rural areas. Um, but, but the question then becomes, how do we tailor that to rural needs where you have um, a, a number of differences? including the, the disease burden in some cases is different. Um, populations aren't as concentrated. Purchasing power is often a bit lower. Um, as we've been talking about on, on, on the mobile side, I mean, the purchasing power then translates into um, reduced access to, uh, to apps that, uh, that cost a lot of money for, for the data. Um, so looking at what are the different requirements, um, one of the things that jumps out to me when we look at this whole picture for rural areas is that in, in many cases, it makes sense to have kind of distribution hubs for different technologies or different services that we want to offer to the patient um, rather than going straight kind of B2C, since in many cases there is this payment issue and unless we're able to tailor the technology so it is USSD or otherwise kind of very affordable. And in, in rural areas, what precisely does that mean? It, it basically means working with, um, on the one hand, clinics, um, public clinics that the government has in different parts of the country. It also means working with PPMVs. Um, and for anyone who's not familiar, that stands for patented and proprietary medicine vendors. Um, and it's basically a different category of pharmacy that the government has established it's basically a pharmacist, pharmacy for a non-pharmacist um, that is only allowed to sell over-the-counter products and only allowed to advise on certain basic conditions, um, but not on more advanced conditions. So I think there, there's a big question of how can we leverage this network of 150,000 to 200,000 PPMVs throughout the country, especially located in rural and kind of peri-urban areas um, to distribute these these different types of health products, um, and at least on on our own side with with life stores, one of the things that we're excited about is the opportunity over time um, to introduce our um, OGA pharmacy software, um, which currently is being used by pharmacies to offer a slimmed down version of that and a cheaper version of that um, for PPMVs, and then secondly the opportunity to provide them. Um, with quality and, and affordable medications to pass on to their patients and different types of kind of um, healthcare products, digital healthcare products that can empower them as providers of care um, to offer better care to the patients. So I, I think that uh, that distribution question is is a critical one for rural areas. There's also been some questions. I keep seeing PPP coming up. Um, and we actually have, we're launching two reports. One was made, um, done in collaboration with Steers on healthcare financing and impact investing. And the second one was actually on project financing and PPPs. Um, so we actually have a whole different report on that. And um, I have a masterclass on that um, as well coming out on YouTube, which will be sent to all attendees. Um, but in terms of public-private partnerships, I think, you know, going back to the formula, the magic formula, which is healthcare can either be paid for by government out of pocket or insurance. Um, we see that um, insurance um, 
a, a, a purely private sector intervention on insurance where private sector pricing occurs would not necessarily and not always give the standard of care that perhaps a country wants to give to its citizens. So I gave the example of my insurance, for instance, um, where I pay per year more than the entire income of most year, um, more than the entire yearly income of most Nigerians, but still I can't get healthcare, I can't get a CT scan, I can't get um, relatively inexpensive tests done on that HMO plan. Yeah, you know, that's would be impossible for like 90% of Nigerians to afford. Um, so that's on the insurance um, spe um, argument. And then there's the out of pocket, which of course we've established that most Africans would be um, too poor to do. Um, so the PPP model actually covers um, the, the final option, which is government spending. And like we said before, um, there's absolutely no country, not the UK, not France, not Germany, not Australia, not New Zealand, not America, um, that has been able to sort of um, provide healthcare to their citizens without government intervention. Um, and um, a lot of countries classify healthcare as sort of a public good or a merit good. So in the same way that nobody really pays for the police, right? But the, we expect that police come to your house. Um, nobody really pays for street lights, or nobody really pays a, apart apart from tolling agreements for for roads. There's some things that in a functional society you just expect um, to be there, um, and I think that a lot of people classify healthcare as one. So PPPs really are a way of bringing private sector capital um, into do public sector things um, and transferring or sharing the risk um, between the public sector and the private sector. Um, so even though the NHS, I did talk a lot about the NHS in my presentation, and I did say it was government spending, there's a lot of private money in the NHS. Of course, the government is using their own money to build those hospitals. The private sector comes in and, you know, builds the hospitals, puts in the infrastructure, sometimes does the maintenance, sometimes does the cleaning. Um, sometimes, so the government really manages that and is in um, it, and pays the salaries of the doctors and um, is in charge of private service um, provision. But a lot of the CapEx spending is still done by the, gov um, it's still done by the private sector because the government can't do anything, everything. It doesn't have the fiscal space to do everything. Um, so the role of PPPs is really finding structures where private sector money can come in to the sector and the government can start getting returns on that money instead of just having to um, spend it all off their balance sheet. So I hope I've answered the question about PPP. Um, any other burning questions? I'll hand it back over to Michael now. I hope he's with us. Yes, I am here. Any other questions? There's tons. I'm just looking through. Any other questions, Michael, that you'd like us to take? No, I believe you answered the questions on insurance and PPP. Yes. Indeed. Um, so I think this is a good opportunity for any final words from any of the panelists before I hand over to Dr. Nkata to give the closing remarks. So any of the panelists have any final words? I, I would just, um, I would thank you and, and uh, Dr. Ola for putting the panel together today. Um, it's It's been really illuminating in, in the presentation up front. And um, yeah, and I, I think for for the, the group of people with us today, thank you for the questions. And I think that the whole discussion um, really sheds light into the, the, the massive opportunity um, in healthcare in, in Nigeria and the rest of Africa. And hopefully we can all work together to, uh, to pursue it. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Andrew. So I, I would like to say thank you to everybody. Sorry for the technical um, difficulties at the beginning. Um, I think it was just getting the live broadcast going that was the issue. But we got there in the end. And, and thank you for all the people for bearing with us. And, you know, still um, hundreds of people turned up. So thank you so much for that. Um, and I think the only parting sort of words that I would give is something that I've been repeating throughout. And I'm going to repeat one more time. In order for healthcare to be supplied, somebody has to pay for it. 
And that's something is either the government, the patient, or an insurance company. Um, and the best areas for investment in healthcare are areas um, or are, are um, sort of interventions that focus on helping one of those three payers, uh, one of those three people that can pay or players that can pay. Um, either it um, decrease the price, increase their access, increase their reach, or increase their efficiency. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Dr. Ola. Um, Dr. Nkata, would you like to give us the closing remarks? Thank you very much for joining us. All. Yeah, um, um, thank you, Michael. Um, just quick introduction. My name is uh, Nkata Chuku. And I'm um, the founding partner of um, Health Systems Consult Limited, HSCL, um, a public health and health systems consulting firm. So um, this has been, I would say, like very loaded, very, 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 very well loaded. And for me, time well spent. Um, I read through the report um, yesterday, my jaw dropped. And then from Dr. Ola's presentation to the sharing of insights and experiences by all the panelists, um, it's very clear that first, we cannot continue to run this level of out-of-pocket um, payments for health and expect to really have any change in health outcomes in Nigeria, right? If we continue to run an out-of-pocket payments of over 50%. We're not going to have the reductions we expect to see in maternal mortality, in infant mortality, in, in, in um, improvement in, in um, you know, quality of life and all that. So we need to move away from out-of-pocket payment. With um, a GDP per capita of um, $2,000, government, Nigeria with the current model, is not going to be able to fund healthcare for all, you know, based on need. So we really need to move towards this, bringing in private sector investment. And we've actually um, seen and heard great examples of going through the typical loan with very high, you know, impossible interests. Uh, people asking for um, three and a half times um, you, you know, the value of, of the loan in property, things that are really just impossible. And then we have this huge opportunity with impact investment where those investments do not only deliver the impact, um, example, I think in 2014, um, I had the opportunity of assessing for a private equity firm some impact investments they had made in health in the health sector in ghana and in nigeria and one of the very interesting indicators they threw in you know um was actually what percentage of those assessing care in those hospitals were those at the bottom of the pyramid you know those in the lowest um socioeconomic um status ladder so while putting money, ensuring that these facilities were able to introduce more services, CT scan, fancy diagnostics and all that, they still had a clear indicator to ensure that the funds they brought in did not crowd out the poor from those facilities. You know, so these and several of these examples show that we can actually achieve both. You know, we can make investments in such a way that we drive social impact and yet and still bring decent returns for investors. So um, to just round up, I think then on the issue of um, technology, just one thing to add, another huge area of opportunity for leveraging technology to improve care in rural areas at the point of care technologies, you know, where technology um, produces lower tech, less power dependent equipment like the handheld ultrasound, some of these things that don't require massive um, infrastructure and a lot of know-how to be able to use in rural areas is another huge area um, of opportunities. 
So just to round up, um, so first, clearly out of pocket is nowhere to go. Government cannot afford to provide health care for everybody. So we do need significant additional investment in healthcare, and impact investment is really one of the ways to go, you know, because it's killing two birds with one stone. You know, we're driving for impact and we're delivering returns to investors. And um, Dr. Last favorite point around healthcare needs to be paid for by somebody and it has to be government, insurance, or the, the individuals or the families who assess care. You know, we can't run away from that. We just can't run away from that. And to conclude, um, one of my former bosses has this saying around this issue of healthcare cannot be free. He says, free healthcare is usually free of care. So if you end up having healthcare that is free, you're likely going to, be, to have healthcare that is not really providing any care at all. So um, thank you very much, everybody for not just participating, but staying with us through to the end. Um, I hope it's been as valuable for you as it's been for me, a lot of learning, a lot of great insights. Um, Dr. La, um, the Flying Doctors and the STS teams, kudos, and thank you very much for having us. Have a great day. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.